Welcome to the ministry of Barefoot Church. I'm Clay Neesmith, the pastor here at Barefoot Church. And man, we hope what you experience here today uh, will encourage you, motivate you, and inspire you in a great, great way. Last weekend, we talked about all of us have a small part to play, a lot like these stained glasses hanging around the auditorium. Uh, There's multiple pieces and there's multiple parts, but it reflects a beautiful image. And we're a lot like that as a church. We are different pieces put together to reflect God's goodness in the earth. And if we're going to do that, we have to understand the heart of our Creator. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, His heart and what we discover through the Christmas story. We're going to begin in Luke chapter 2 with verse 8 and read a little bit. And and then we're going to talk about being this amazing reflection in the earth. The Bible says this, that night, that night when Jesus was born, there were shepherds staying in the field nearby. They were guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them. And the radiance of the Lord's glory, his majesty, it, it surrounded these shepherds. The Bible says they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you shepherds, you're going to recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped in snugly strips of cloth. Now, this wouldn't have been an unusual Uh, thing in that particular culture. Every baby would have been wrapped in snugly strips of cloth. In other words, when the baby was born, they would typically wrap them up. Maybe your translation says in swaddling clothes. That's what we uh, like to say sometimes. But it was simply strips of cloth. Nothing unusual about this baby born being in strips of cloth. But here it is. It says this. It says, you'll find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Now, the question we should ask when we see that a king or a savior or a liberator or a messiah is being born into the earth and the sign that this is the messiah is that he is in a manger in a feeding trough, let's call it, because that's literally what it is, Uh, a king being born in a manger should make us begin to ask questions. Why would the most high God come into the earth and be born into a feed trough? And I really think that the manger scene has a whole lot more significance in our life today to experience the majesty or the glory of God because the glory of God was, was surrounding the shepherds when, when God said, go see this manger. But the manger has a whole lot more to do with our experience with God's majesty than sometimes we understand. God wants to be experienced. Let me say that again. Your creator desires to be experienced by you. In other words, he he don't want you just to know who he is as a distant creator. No, no, he's a heavenly father. He's the one that created you and he created me. And his desire is not, not to just know about him, but his desire is for us to experience him, know him, be in a relationship. Relationships are to be experienced, by the way. Um, To experience him in a relationship and then be able to reflect him, be image bearers here in the earth. And so God is always telling a story. God, God tells stories through things that he does. And, And the story he's teaching us through this manger is not just, hey, a king is going to be born in a feed trough out in the middle of nowhere. No, no, he's teaching us that really, if you want to experience the most high God, then you have to be willing to go to the lowest place. Come on, somebody. In, in In other words, he's saying, if you want to experience my majesty 
and reflect who I am into the earth, be who I've created you to be, then, then you have to be willing to become a servant. Amen. And what we learn from the manger is, is God is calling us to be servants in a lot of capacity. And again, it, it's, it's so much bigger than, than just somebody being born in a feed trough. How unusual is that? I mean, the people would have been looking for a king or a messiah or a liberator just like you would, not to be born out in a field in the middle of nowhere in a feed trough. They would have been looking for him to be born in, in some sort of royal robe somewhere, okay? And, and literally, again, God catches humanity off guard in this moment in time because God is revealing something about his character, about who he is, about what he wants to do in us and through us. And it's simply, he's showing us that, you know what, if we're willing to begin to serve him because he's created us to serve, then we'll begin to discover his majesty and be able to live that out in the world. See, see most people don't understand they're created to serve. I mean, you're wired to serve. I don't care who you are. I don't care what color your hair is. You know what, where you come from, you're created by the most high God, the creator to serve. Come on. And, and, and your goal, the goal in serving is this, is, is to be this image bearer of who God is. Remember the garden? You remember he said, you know, I'm creating both male and female in, in our image. And what they're gonna do is be a reflection of me as they govern the earth. They were to take care of things. They were to serve. And if they did that, God was gonna provide for them in an incredible way, they were going to experience God and walk with the creator for all eternity. But they got it off track. They began to serve. They began to serve more or less themselves. And, and they, they forgot that they were created to be a servant of the most high God. And the majesty of God was going to shine through them in a powerful way. And guess what? That same majesty wants to shine through you. Wants to shine through me. Wants to shine through us. It's what the church is about, my friends. It's about being a part of something bigger than yourself. It's about being gifted by the most high God and connecting that gift to the other pieces so that we can become a masterpiece or a, a majestic thing like these stained glass windows. So what does this manger begin to, to teach us about us experiencing the most high God? Not only that we need to be dependent on him or so to say, come to him like, Jesus was in a manger, but it, but it teaches us what humility is all about. See, God loves a humble heart. The Bible says God opposes the proud, but gives grace, gives unmerited favor to the humble. So, so what does that mean? That, that simply means, you know what, that, that God wants you to humble yourself before him. Many people mistake what humility is. Humility isn't bowing down to everything. Humility is position, positioning yourself before your creator and, and basically saying, I'm coming to you, the authority of my life, and I'm going to take on full confidence in who you say that I am, and then I'm going to walk fully in it. Yeah. Don't, don't mistake confidence in being who God created you to be as something against humility. Those are two very different things. You can humbly walk before God, okay, and be fully confident in who he calls you to be. Amen. And a lot of times people will say, well, a confident person is a cocky person. No, maybe a confident person has gotten in a position of humility, but come before their heavenly father, has got a download in who God says that they are, and they're walking it out in their life. See, see, Humility is a beautiful thing. And, and what God's teaching us through this manger is if we're going to experience his, his, you know, his majestic self and his glory, we, we have to be willing to come to him with a humble heart. Listen to how Jesus said it as, as he grew older and he was talking to, to his friends. They were asking a question about how to become great in God's family or God's kingdom. And Jesus says it this way in Matthew 18, verses one through five. The Bible says about this time, the disciples, they came to Jesus and they asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child, a little child to him, and he put the child among them. 
Notice Jesus is illustrating something. In other words, just like God illustrated something through this manger, now Jesus, he, he pulls a little kid over next to him when somebody asks him about greatness. And he says, you want to be great? You want to be great in my kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of eternity? He says, here's how you do it. He goes on to say, Jesus called a little child over to him and among them, and then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins, unless you stop going in the wrong direction, unless you humble your heart and come before your creator and let him tell you who you are, unless you turn away from doing it just your way, he says, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Become like these children and you will never... Uh, if you don't become like these children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Now, what is Jesus saying? He's saying humility is coming to your heavenly father a lot like a child would come to their parent. In other words, full dependence. Amen. And I don't know if you've ever seen a child before they got to be like five or six and they just kind of didn't want to do everything they wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? But I'm talking about a little baby here. A, a, a baby is fully dependent upon their parents. The baby born in the manger was fully dependent upon his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph. And, and Jesus is saying, you got to humble your heart and come to your father like a little child would, would come to their parents. See, children are amazing because they, they fully trust you know, what, what is in front of them and they trust that their parents are going to provide for them. They trust that their parents are going to build them up. They trust that their parents are going to guide them in the right direction. And if we take on our responsibility as parents, they'll begin to grow and learn and discover that we are for them and we are not against them. And amazing things begin to happen in their life. But see, Jesus is saying, if you want to experience God, stop being rebellious like, like a teenager and a know-it-all. He says, you want to be great in the kingdom? It's about, it's about dropping yourself down Amen. and humbling your heart before your creator and saying, God, I want to do great things. And I can tell you, the moment you do that, God is going to give you an assignment. Amen. Yes, because what God is in is into your servant assignment into you being fully human and being who he has created you to be. And my friend, make no bones about it. God has created you to connect with his family. And today, his family is here on earth as it is in heaven, and it's called the local church. It is not a perfect place. It is not a perfect people. But if you want to discover the majesty of God, that's where you begin to connect your gift in a powerful way and say, God, you know what? I believe you can use us to do amazing things. And by the way, my heart is humble enough to believe that, that I'm not the only kid in the family. In other words, it, it, it's not all about me and my, my gift. It's not all about me and just my relationship. God, you love my siblings too. You love my siblings no matter where they come from. And God, I humble my heart and I realize that, you know what, I got two eyeballs just like they do. I, I walk around just like they do. I'm either male or female just like they are. And God, I know you created us in your image to do great things and I believe greatness is in them too. And so I don't elevate myself above people. I bring myself alongside of people and I serve with God's people to display his amazing greatness to the world. See, see, it's not about elevating yourself. It's about taking hold of who God says that we are. In due season, God will elevate us. In due season, God will elevate us. It just takes every part 
to play their part and let's see what God can do. And God's saying, would you humble your heart and come before me like a little child? Children are hungry to learn, my friend. They're hungry to learn. They, they want to know what's next. They ask lots of questions. They, 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 they want to be built up in their life. They, wanna, they want you to love them and they want to be loved. This is the heart of a child. They, they want to grow. They want to experience uh, things. And again, he's saying, man, have that kind of heart when you come to God. When's the last time you come to God with great respect and believe that he knew it all? Oh, by the way, he does. He is all powerful, all knowing, and he's everywhere at one time. But when's the last time you approached him like you know it all? And guess what? I haven't yet figured it all out. And God, I don't know why you put this jack leg in my life. Come on. But I have a humble heart. And I know that they're here for a purpose. And it's us doing something together. And God, you have a plan for their life just like you have for my life. I humble myself before you and let's see what you can do through us. What if humanity begin to ask that question? Not God, what can you do through me? But God, what can you do through us together being your family doing what you designed us to do? Next thing I wrote down about humility and this dependency and what this manger teaches us is, is it teaches us that God is provider. Again, a, a small kid needs to be provided for. They can't get up and walk yet. They need formula, right? Or breast milk or whatever, however you feed them. They don't need Cheetos yet, for sure, right? <laughs> but they can't go get their own food. They're helpless. And this baby born in a manger was truly a baby, but it was God in the flesh. It was a God who had the power to do everything, but he chose to lay in a manger in the middle of nowhere in a feed trough to demonstrate something. It is no accident that God was born in a manger, that Jesus was born in a manger. It was on a purpose. It wasn't simply because Mary and Joseph were trying to travel to a another city, that was a circumstance. But God predicted this 700 years that the Christ child would be born before it ever happened in a manger in Bethlehem. And what's interesting is, guess what? God worked his plan out exactly like he thought it was gonna be worked out or he knew it was gonna be worked out. And, and again, the baby represents that Dependency believes in God's, God's provision. Yes, he will save his people from their sins, from going in their own direction, doing life their own way and not coming underneath my leadership. Yes, he will do that. But right now, he's a baby in a manger and I am, I am his provider. I wanna show you a fascinating passage of scripture once Jesus grew up to, to begin to demonstrate to those around him that God is a provider. See, when, when Jesus belonged to the, to the Jewish groups that surrounded the temple in, in Jerusalem, they had to come and they, they paid this thing called a temple tax. It was instituted through Moses in the wilderness long, long bef before the temple was ever built, before the tent of meeting was ever built. And God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to... to provide this tax through my people, and that's gonna help take care of the place of worship. And so when Jesus came along, it was basically custom that they would bring this tax into the temple. But there were some people questioning whether Jesus was paying the temple tax or not when the bucket came by. And what's interesting is Peter one of his closest friends don't know whether Jesus is paying his temple tax or not, but he defends Jesus in the face of those who were accusing Jesus of not paying his temple tax. And I wanna show you the story because Jesus reveals something to us that is simply amazing. Matthew 17, verses 24 through 27. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the 
of the two drachma temple tax came and came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. And when Peter came into the house, Jesus didn't let Peter speak first. The Bible says Jesus was the first to speak. So they come out of that, that scenario. Now they walk into the house and Jesus says, hey, Peter, what's up? What do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their, from their children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that they may not, so that we may not cause offense to those who are asking you the question, here's what I need you to do, Peter. I want you to go to the lake. I want you to throw out your line and take the first fish you catch. And I want you to open its mouth and you'll find four drachma coin. Four, not just two. Not just the two that I'm gonna pay my tax with, but the two, Peter, you're gonna pay yours with too. Look, take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Amen. Now that's a, it's kind of an odd scripture towards the end of Jesus' life. And it's a miracle that involves Jesus, but it involves Jesus, uh, Jesus using Peter to go catch a fish out of the lake and the first fish he catches and says, look, when you catch this fish, guess what? That fish is going to have our tax in there. I need you to go to the temple. I need you to pay it so we don't offend those people. That's interesting. But what he's teaching Peter is this. Peter, you just told a lie when those people ask you, have I paid my temple tax? Because I ain't paid it yet. But there's a reason I haven't paid it. Because I'm, I'm the son of the most high God. And he says, children don't have to pay the tax. And by the way, I'm the one they're all looking for and paying the tax towards the temple for anyway because they're all looking for me and out of this temple, they should be looking for me and worshiping me and I am the child. And guess what? Child, children are exempt from this tax, so to say. And he says, but here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pay it and I'm gonna do a miracle so you can understand something, Peter. Not only does God the creator provide for me, but he'll provide for you too. I need you to go get this money out of this fish's mouth and go pay our taxes together. But Peter, the lesson in this for you is, you know what, you need to stop depending on just, you know, what we do and what we don't do and the tax we pay and the, you know, all of these variations of things. You need to start understanding that God is the provider of everything. Come on. And here's what I want to say in that today. And see, God's looking for us to have a heart of humility to experience his majesty. But he's also looking to us to trust him and come to him as our provider in everything in life. And, you know, again, I, I, I wouldn't dare stand up here and tell you that God commands you today to give a a certain portion of your money to him to, to get something from him. In other words, I wouldn't tell you that's a commandment of God. A, a tithe isn't, isn't a command from God so that, you know what, you, you begin to get more from God. No, no. As a matter of fact, God's not even commanding it to you. What, what God's doing is saying, would you bring... Would you bring a tenth, that's what a tithe is, back to me as an offering to say you trust me as provider? And, and again, you know, we don't, we don't come around and say, did you pay your temple tax? Did you do this? Did you do that? Because that's not, that's not what that's about. What it's about is, is your heart. And it's about a relationship with you believing God is your provider. And again, it's not that God's not going to do this or do that if you don't pay this. See, see, you're misinterpreting what, what all of that's about if you're believing it to be a command and, oh, shoot, if I only give 9%, God's going to strike me dead. No, 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 that's, that's not true. See, God's looking at the heart. 
And my friend, it's not about the amount. It's about the heart you bring anything Amen. with to God. Amen. And do you have a humble enough heart to believe that God provides everything? And I'm not just talking about your, your job. I'm not just talking about you know, keeping uh, things from happening uh, to, to your cars breaking down. or, or uh, to your. Uh, I'm talking about like the breath in your lungs, the heartbeat in your chest. Do you, do you believe that God is the good good giver of all gifts and he gives you everything yeah. you have in life. Do you, do you really trust him in that? Yes, because what that begins to look like is God, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to grow up and, and become proud, God. I'm, I'm going to keep a humble heart like a little child and I'm always going to come to you as, as my provider and I'm, I'm going to humbly bow before you like, like I'm in a manger and I'm going to believe that you're going to provide everything for me and I'm going to mature in my faith. I'm not going to stay like a little child and, and you know not grow and mature, but I'm going to stay like a little child with my heart and I'm going to trust you for everything. See, see, the, the manger is teaching us about trust. And if we're going to see the majesty of God, it starts, my friend, with trust in your heavenly father and your creator. It's a great thing to begin to trust a God as a provider. Humble your heart and not believe that, you know, it's, it's me producing it. Because that's easy to do when, when you're a lot like me. I mean, when, when you're a lot like me, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're a big old burly guy, you, you, you think you, you do everything on your own. You really do. You, you begin to think, man, this, this is about me doing it. No, it's not about you doing it. It's about God doing it through us together. And a humble heart says, man, I'm going to get back in the manger and I'm going to believe that it's God providing, it's God doing, and it's God doing miracles through us to, to reveal who he is to the world. And this is what I love about that Giving Hope Mall we did yesterday. It's an opportunity for us to come together. And, and I want to share with you what happened last weekend. I stood on this stage and said, look, you know, we're looking to provide for, for about... 350 kids this Christmas through our church through giving these gifts. And I, I stood here last weekend and I said, we have about 140 of those, those gifts in hand, so we, we need a couple of hundred gifts. Well, six days later, yesterday, all of a sudden, you, being the hands and feet of Jesus, provided... Beyond the 140, you provided, beyond the 150, you provided, you know, almost uh, uh, enough gifts for 450 kids. Come on. And families. Now, some of those families didn't uh, respond to our phone calls and didn't show up, and some of those gifts were left. But, but what, am I, what am I saying? is when we submit ourselves uh, to God and we come together and we believe that God wants to touch the community through us, through our serving, hundreds of volunteers here. It was an amazing, amazing day. But here's what I want to tell you. We got about, about half of those gifts left over. So don't bring no more toys up in this place. <laughs> we don't need no more toys. But the beautiful thing is this. What does that teach us? Well, it teaches me that God can provide more yes. than we can imagine or think of or think that we need. And I want you to know that not one of those gifts would go to waste. If you know a family this week that needs to get in touch with us, we're well, we're well stocked and well supplied to help those families out this week. We, we, you know, we're going back through our call list and some of the families may have had their phone turned off or whatever else. We're doing our best to get in touch with those folks because we truly want to serve those, you know what, who have a need. We want to lift them up so they can begin to understand the love of God and the majesty of God. It's the whole reason we do uh, the Giving Hope Mall. But we had more volunteers in here than we need. People were standing around. They were bored out of their mind. I was in here for a few, a few hours and people were like, what do you want me to do? And again, you know, well, I don't want you to do anything but just love on people. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know what, what happened with all those people here because we had too many people serving? They began to build community. 
They, they began to build relationships. Oh, I didn't know you came to Barefoot Church because I come to the first service, you come to the second service. Oh, you come to the third service. or you know. And they began to talk and communicate and build these relationships. See, what I'm trying to tell you is when we submit ourselves humbly before God and become a part of his family and become a part of the greater vision of reaching out to the community, God majestically begins to show up in our, in our life in a powerful way. I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you on behalf of God. To not just come to church, but let's be the church. Partner up and let's see what God can do. Because it is incredible to watch God work through these scenarios and situations. And God did more than we can think of. And we're going to continue to expand those gifts and, and leverage those gifts to do amazing things in this community. But right now, we don't need any more toys. But here's what we are going to do. I don't know if you watched the news over the last couple of days. But you know what? We want to show the heart of God in unlikely circumstances to things like have happened in Kentucky and Illinois. There's been a tremendous loss of life. Christmas is two weeks away. Streets have been devastated. Toys strode in ponds. Mattresses in trees. People can't find their family members. I'm talking about whole communities devastated. Churches. Personally, I've been connected to three churches. Personally, already in two days. That don't, the buildings don't stand anymore. But those, those churches, those people are still standing in their community. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be the church globally. And we're going to, we're going to try to take resources and we're going to try to put it in a, in a place that can really make a difference for the glory of God and the majesty of God in a, in a tragic situation. Yes. Yes. See, see, I don't stand up here and tell you I understand why all these devastating things happen. But I do understand a God that can take those moments yes, and use us to show His majesty in a powerful, powerful way. Come on. And so if you do want to extend some form of help to, to that region, we're going to partner up with ARC, Association of Related Churches, a bunch of churches that's related in mission. We're not all the same style of church, okay? But we're related in mission. Amen. It's to get the heart of Jesus in communities and in people's lives so their life can be transformed forever. And so we're going to partner up with ARC and we're going to, put whatever resources, I don't, I don't know how much we can do, but we're gonna put those resources together with other churches from our region and around the globe, actually. And, 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 and I, I know the church isn't perfect, okay? I, I know the church gets a bad rap sometimes. On, on, I'm not talking about just this church, it gets a bad rap too, but I'm talking about globally. But, but I'm here to tell you the church is God's vehicle and hope to humanity through Christ Jesus. And, and the church is doing a beautiful thing. And so we're going to come together with churches from around the globe and we're going to put those resources together and let's see what God can do. But again, it's not what God can do through me. It's not what just God can do through you, but what God can do through us. And we're going to extend hospitality and kindness through these resources the best we know how in that community. Again, if your know, heart, heart's not move to make provision for that or you can't make provision for that we totally understand but we're going to try our best and so if you want to earmark your gift for that today you know what we're going to do is we're going to share that with that region to do the best we can as a church and be a family and really show the majesty of God see, see that's us you know what moving in such a way and, and, and serving in our community we don't just serve our community just to serve our community. We do it because it's the heart of our creator. It's, it's the heart of him saying, look, I, I'm looking for a humble people to be a reflection of who I am in the earth and, and use what they have, bring it together and recognize I provide everything and then to impact what's around them for my glory and my kingdom. And my friend, God is doing great things. I invite you into it. And may you and I take the steps of faith to believe that he's a majestic God and he wants to work through us to do these incredible things. Let me pray for you today. God, you're an amazing God. And I thank you for the story of Jesus. I thank you, God, how you're a, a God who doesn't 
just teach us with words, but God, you teach us with visuals. I thank you for every visual illustration you've given us throughout the scripture to reveal your glory to us. And we thank you for putting on skin, for coming in the flesh. And God, you know what? Being born in a manger, growing up, going to a cross, defeating death, resurrecting from a grave and ascending back to heaven. We believe, Jesus, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and you came from heaven to earth and we put our faith in you. You didn't just come to forgive our sins. You came to restore the relationship so we could walk humbly before our Creator and know that He is for us and not against us. And if there's one here today that hasn't put their faith in God's amazing grace, His name is Jesus. My friend, I pray today would be the day you enter into his family and begin to let him work in you and work through you to show his majesty off. He's wanting to connect with our hearts, but we have to submit ourselves to him like a little child. So if that is you today, maybe you want to just say something like this in the quietness of where you sit. Just say, God, today I surrender. And I come to you, Lord. And I believe that Jesus came and gave his life for me and came to reconnect me back to you, my creator. Say, God, I humbly come and I trust that you're gonna provide for me from this point forward all the days of my life to carry out your purpose and your plan. Tell God, thank you for the gift. And may we all keep a heart like a kid in a manger and see God do the amazing things. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We hope you were encouraged, motivated, and inspired today by the message. And again, man, we believe in you. We believe great things for you. It's because of many people's faithful giving that we're able to go out around the world. If you choose to invest in Barefoot Church, just go on over to barefootchurch.com. You can give there. But go out, live your purpose, and be inspired in a great, great way.